Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. Uh, this talk is called Async Rust, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, really briefly before I get into it, uh, I wanted to say how thankful I am to be back here at this conference. I've gone to many conferences over the years in many countries around the world, and this is one of my favorite conferences in the entire world. Uh, Todd and Danny and crew always do a fantastic job, and they truly care about this city and this community, and so you should be really thankful if you're from here that you have something like this going on. So I haven't been here in a couple years, and I'm really, really glad to, to come back. Um, if you don't know who I am, uh, I used to work on Rust uh, full-time as a job for about 10 years in total. I was on the Rust core team. I was literally at Rust Lang on Twitter. If that account made a joke back at you, that was secretly me. Uh, and I've, I've done a lot, and I've been around the Rust community for an extremely long time. Uh, people make jokes about, like, oh, yeah, nobody has 10 years' experience in Rust. I actually do. Um, so. I no longer am part of the Rust project, and so today I'm going to be giving a talk about some things about Rust, but I want to just like mention that these I'm no longer that official spokesperson person, so all these opinions are uh, my own. I hate saying stuff like this because it feels like I'm trying to sell you a podcast. Like, oh yeah, listen to my raw, unfiltered, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just like, I feel like since I did that officially for so long, I need to put a little disclaimer that this is, these are my opinions. Um, and so we're going to talk about async Rust which, if you are not super familiar, Rust gained the async and await syntax and keywords and stuff in 2018, and it's been a couple years. And this continues to be an area of the Rust project that has like a lot of people saying a lot of stuff about it all the time. Uh, I don't really know why this particular feature gets so many people to have such heated debates, but we're going to talk about common criticisms of async Rust. I'm going to tell you whether I think those criticisms are good or bad. Uh, there are both, and uh, you know all that, that kind of stuff. So before we get into those specifics, though, there's this thing called Wadler's Law. And Philip Wadler is a programming language guy. He's worked on Haskell and other languages for a while. And he has this, uh, this law named after him. In any programming language design, the total time that's spent discussing a feature in this list is proportional to 2 raised to the power of its position. This is a math joke. Can you tell it came from the Haskell folks? Uh, Zero is semantics, one syntax, two lexical syntax, and three the lexical syntax of comments. Now, this is particularly funny because you're like, why does this list start from zero? Like, you may think that's just a programmer joke, but zero to the power of two is zero. So this is also joking that no one ever wants to argue about semantics at all. They they only want to argue about syntax, and then even more in each syntax. And this is a very real thing that happens when talking about language design. However, this is the like most famous version of this uh, idea, but he actually had a slightly separate one that I think matters and is, uh, as well, and we're going to kind of get into it. So the emotional intensity of the debate on a language feature increases as you go down this scale. And so people tend to like get really emotional when talking about programming languages syntax. I swear that's true. Um, have you ever cried in a discussion about programming language syntax before? I haven't. I've only cried when discussing what integers should be named. Uh, this was a real, actual, giant debate in the Rust world, and it was, it, there's a long story there I don't have time to get into, but just like the point is, is like naming what should int be named uh, got 240 comments in this GitHub thread alone. There were many more of them, and it was actually very emotionally trying and all these other things. But this talk is not really about the trauma of having hundreds of people argue about your work on the internet. But it's also like not not about that exactly. Um, so let's talk about people arguing about things. First, like Wadler's Law, let's talk about syntax. Um, so if you've used async await in programming languages before, you may recognize how you use the async keyword. This is C sharp, which is largely credited as the first language to have this feature. Say so public static async task main. Uh, and then we have JavaScript in the middle. You say async function, async call, and that declares an async function. And then finally, at the bottom, you have Rust. Async function, hello world. Cool. All very normal and consistent. Now, if you talk about the await part of await, uh, async await, uh, in C sharp, we have this integer, which is going to be awaiting something called downloading. In JavaScript, we await resolve after two seconds. But in Rust, we say learn song dot await. It looks like a method. It's not a prefix keyword. This, like, it was rough. Um, now, the Rust has this open RFC process where we can just talk about features before they happen, and like anyone can comment on a GitHub issue and talk about these things. And so, here is the initial RFC for async await. 
uh, by Without Boats, who you will see later again in this presentation. Um, but you may notice this says conversation 262 comments. And you're like, oh my god, that's like a bunch of comments. Now, not all of these are about the syntax, of course, but like, it wasn't just this. See, there was also like uh, this other thread, and then there was this other thread, this one, which was purely about the syntax. You notice that says 512 comments, okay, 512. But that wasn't even all of it. There was also this discussion summary that happened before that particular thing was posted. You may notice this <laughs> discourse thread has 212 comments of people talking about that. And that even isn't actually the end of it. Here's the thread on the final proposal. And that also ended up, weirdly enough, with like another 212 comments. And finally, this links to the blog post thread that also was on this, and that had 151 in and of itself. I've completely lost track. When I was putting this slide together, I was like, I could add all these numbers up, but like it doesn't matter, right? It's huge. And this is basically just like talking about should, like how should that syntax look? Now, part of the problem with this is indirectly my fault. Um, I wrote this blog post that was very influential uh, in the Rust world and maybe a little bit out of it called the Language Strangeness Budget. And I had been thinking about like why several other programming languages that had been tried like didn't really work out, like why they didn't gain a ton of adoption. Because the Rust project, even when it was a research project, was really interested in being useful in industry. It wanted to be adopted. This wasn't the kind of language that if no one used it but someone got a PhD out of it, it would have succeeded. Like Rust needed to be useful for industry and that was an express goal of basically everyone involved. And so we were really interested in the early days in talking about this. Um, you'll notice this is from 2015. Uh, this is about roughly a month after Rust 1.0 launched. I wrote this blog post and basically what the strangeness budget is, is I think that your programming language gets a couple weird things. Like you get a pass on like, let's say three or four things that are weird. And if you want adoption, everything else had better be super normal. Because the problem is if you're too weird, people aren't willing to try you out. But like also, if you don't have anything new and a little weird, there's not a lot of reason to use whatever language it is that you're building. So this is this kind of idea is like you want to have some stuff, but you need to be really deliberate about what stuff is weird. And so like if everyone else is using prefix await syntax, we risk being confusion. Like is this a thing that Rust wants to be weird about it? And is it worth it? And a lot of this discussion um, was about this thing. Like, like shouldn't we just do what everyone else does? But like also there's reasons why that's kind of bad. So like is this worth the confusion? And uh, you know that was, that was happening in 2017, 2018 that we were talking about it, and now it's 2023. So I can tell you, yes, it absolutely was worth it. I actually tried to make this yes bigger. Did you know Google Slides only lets you make fonts 400 uh, pixels tall? Uh, I was kind of mad about it. I wanted it to be so big it was like half off the screen because this is like absolutely, completely a win. And not only is it like ends up not being weird, we've had JavaScript folks show up and write Rust and then be like, oh my god, I'm so annoyed when I go back to JavaScript and I have to write await beforehand. So like in this case, all of that consternation, all of the, I almost said blood and tears, there was no, there was no blood involved. Uh, all its tears, all that emotional effort that went into arguing about this and other aspects of this design, we were basically arguing about nothing. It was hypothetical. Maybe things would have turned out a different way, but like this is unequivocally a win. And so how did it end up unequivocally a win? Well, so like let's talk about like why this syntax is like a little bit weird and like how you can fix it. So again, like with it being on the, 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 the end of things, that's like a little bit strange. So this is code that you would want someone to write in theory. Uh, they need to learn a song and then sing it, and both of those are asynchronous functions. So we wait on their results and then do the thing. And so the problem basically is like, well, what happens if somebody doesn't know Rust is weird like this and they write the normal thing? And the answer is that like, you make the compiler also parse the wrong syntax and then give a special customized error message. It's like, hey, by the way, you thought that it was a prefix thing, but it's not actually. You want it to be a postfix operation. And this means if anyone is confused by this, the compiler immediately and helpfully tells them what they need to do. And so this basically just like completely made it trivial to use instead. And I unironically think this error message is one of the reasons why this was so successful. Because 
you're able to you know, make the wrong thing, you make it easier to do the right thing by pointing out the wrong thing. And this is another really interesting area of where like building production compilers is different than ones you may build for classes, is like there's actually several places in Rust where the folks who work on the developer experience of the compiler make it parse other common syntaxes just purely to give you a good custom error message. It's like, hey, by the way, I see what you did there. I get it. It's not how we do things around here. Like, it's fine. Um, and so just this little thing that's not even technically part of the language, it's like a, a feature of the compiler that we couldn't have done, completely fixed this big problem. And maybe if we had like understood that this was so good at the time, uh, we could have not had all of those arguments. Okay, but like why did we do postfix await in the first place? Like why is this, why is this actually a better way of doing the syntax? Here's the thing. <laughs> if you're calling a bunch of other asynchronous functions inside of your function that's asynchronous, and you probably are because that's the reason you're doing async stuff is you're, you, know, you want a lot of it, uh, the ability to chain things with a weight is really, really useful. And so would you rather write the thing on the top or the thing on the bottom? I have had some people try to troll me and be like, definitely the thing on the bottom, and I'm like, I don't believe you, and I'm not paying attention to your opinions anymore. But uh, like, the top thing is like basically completely good. And there's also a more specific like Rust reason why this is the case, and that is, if you haven't written very much Rust anymore, we have an operator called the question mark operator, and what this does is, if a function returns an error, this will propagate the error upwards. It's like kind of feels like exceptions, but it's not exceptions. But like, you sort of sort of feels like it. And so the problem is, is that, and this is one of the reasons why we initially decided to talk about this syntax is that if you have a function that's synchronous and it returns an error, you add this question mark onto the end and that helps you handle the error. But if you wanted to await something that was asynchronous and returned an error and you have prefix await, you would need to like parenthesize the await bar and then add the question mark at the end. And it's like, why is this like adding a whole bunch of stuff when at the bottom you can just do dot await and then tack the question mark on and everything is nice and normal. And so we could have also gone with this like, precedence thing where like, oh, well, the, the await bytes binds more tightly to the function call than the question mark, and so he could have written the third option, but then you're like, okay, there's this weird parsing rule that everything else follows a normal thing, but await is like stronger than other operators, and all that kind of stuff is like nobody but programming language implementers really care about the details there, and it ends up being confusing and like a whole bunch of other things. Now, I'm gonna spend a lot of this talk saying that other people's criticisms of async await and Rust are like not, not compelling to me. Let's see, I get a little bit of that politician back. I don't find them personally compelling, but I wanna point out that in this particular discussion, I was just straight up wrong. I was like, this is not a thing we can spend our strangeness budget on. I know it's a little more awkward, but like it's really important things are familiar. Do we really wanna waste this? I was just, I was just flat out incorrect, and so, I'm gonna be presenting a lot of my opinions, but I also want to let you know that I truly know more than almost anyone else that I often have bad opinions that I later disagree with my past self on. And so I wanted to start this talk before I get into some other things with an example of just like me being flat wrong to be like, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect here. Um, okay, so back to Wadler's Law. Why do people argue about syntax and the lexical syntax of comments and not semantics? And the reason is basically, if you'd never programmed in Rust before, I'm pretty sure that you could have understood my previous couple of slides. Like, you don't really need to know that much about async await or even Rust to like get how that problem works. Therefore, you can have an opinion about it. Is your opinion well formed? No, but you read three lines of code and so you can develop your own opinion. Whereas if you wanna start talking about the semantics of how this works, you now need to learn a lot more stuff. I've given like two full 45 minute talks on how Rust async await works in the past. And so like, it's just a, simply a higher barrier of entry. And there's nothing the matter with that exactly, but like once you multiply it times the whole internet, the chance that you're gonna get like a completely massive conversation that's very heated, that like again, because we're talking about surface level things, uh, people have for some reason very strong opinions and they're also like not really willing to back down or like admit they're wrong. For some reason, some, like syntax discussions get real nasty and like semantics discussions, it's like hard to get people to even show up to have them. And so there's like something about this where the further down you get, the easier it is to have an opinion, and therefore like you get a lot more noise. And so this talk is gonna kinda go in the opposite direction. I think if there's a broad sort of like 
through line through my examples here is that the ones that I don't find very compelling are the ones that only have very surface level criticisms. And the things that I think that are bad about Rust async await and the things that do need to be improved, unfortunately rely on a whole bunch of real nerd details that you need to like actually work through and have some experience and do those kinds of things. And why I'm frustrated about the state of the discourse on this topic is because unfortunately, the people that want to talk about syntax are taking up so much space, it makes it impossible to actually criticize async. Like, I spend all my time on the internet defending async Rust, even though I have my own criticisms of it, just because I think that the criticisms that people bring up all the time are, like, not particularly great. So we're going to talk about some that, like, uh, you know, that I'm not very convinced by, and then we're going to talk about some things that I think are genuinely actually bad. Um, so I also don't want to be like, this talk is purely about defending async await, but it's going to start off with me defending it, and then slowly I'm going to be like, yeah, that makes a little more sense until like now I'm like, here's the thing that I think is actually wrong. One other thing about commenting on the internet. Has anybody read the book Ender's Game? I, this book is very famous. I don't, I liked it, but I don't really like it anymore. It's not really a big deal. There's a plot point, a subplot point in this book. I don't know if you remember, where like uh, Locke and Demosthenes Demosthenes, I wrote it down and I still can't say it correctly even though I practiced like 10 times last night. There's a plot point in this book where two kids decide they want to like get involved in politics and their idea is if they just argue on the internet passionately enough that everyone will see how brilliant they are and they will be like put in charge of the government and that like sort of kind of happens. And I just like, I forgot about this aspect of the book until I was working on this talk and I was like, man, can you like imagine if like the people that were arguing on the internet were like, everyone's like, oh, man, I read your blog post about this thing and like now, you know, I'm like, you're, you're the president now or whatever. Like that's like not what really happens. And I can say that because I am, as of last night, the 23rd highest karma account on Hacker News. Like this is me. I am the person who is making these arguments on the internet. And to be clear, like I didn't implement any of Rust async await. Other people did. And they didn't really spend a lot of time arguing on the internet because they were too busy implementing async await. Um, so... I am just as guilty in many ways of these kinds of things that people are talking about. Um, so we're going to start off with what I'm going to call forum grade criticism of async await. Um, these are the things that I find most annoying and I don't really agree with, but I'm going to try to give like a, a good explanation of why I think that's true. Because I also want to make it clear, again, I'm not in charge of decisions of anything. So if you think my criticism of your criticism is bad, it's like literally irrelevant. Just don't listen to me. But I do think that it's important to take these criticisms seriously, even if I don't agree with them. And so I'm going to try to like get to the underlying reason why people say the stuff they do and not just say it's because they don't really know anything about the details. Because I do think that's important. Here's my number one pet peeve. Rush shouldn't have implemented async await because it's a special case of monads and dune notation. Um, I actually really like monads. I think it's really funny to point out when something's actually really a monad in a random conversation. I was in a work call the other day and someone was like, man, it's really annoying to propagate this const parameter around in every single function. And I'm like, well, you need is a monad. And he's like, stop it, Steve. I'm like, I know. So I do this too. But it is true that async await is like an effect and you can do this in, like, in languages that support monads and do notation, you could implement it that way. And so what these people are basically arguing is, is that like if you put in this specialized feature, a more general feature will come along and it will subsume it. And that's bad language design because like there's no reason to go with the super specific feature when you could have the more general feature. And I do think that that is like a coherent criticism in general. And it is a language design principle that I often agree with. But here's the problem with that. And uh, it's, it's one of my favorite ways to not tell someone to fuck off, but to actually tell them to fuck off, which is, that's an open research question. Um, and the thing is, is that languages that have monads and do notation are all garbage collected languages, and like the semantics in which they are able to do that kind of abstraction rely on that machinery. And so like, there isn't a language that doesn't have a garbage collector or a ton of heap allocation that has monads and do notation. And so like, I literally, said this to someone, it's like, so wait, you're saying that I need to basically go get a PhD in programming language stuff, implement a novel feature no one's ever heard of before, and then we can finally write network services in Rust? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, that does not the same goals. Like, and this is oftentimes why research languages and actual languages that people use for like work at their jobs are different. And that's because this kind of trade-off is one that's made all the time in programming languages. So I don't, I don't think that this is a bad criticism in a vacuum, but for Rust specific goals, which are to be useful in industry and be something that people actually use, uh, you know, 
th it's an open research question, I'm sorry. Um, and now it's also true that like a lot of things that Russ did were originally open research questions when Russ did them. So I also don't want to discourage people from exploring these kinds of things because I think someone may eventually crack that nut and I'm going to be excited whenever whatever Rust++ exists that has monads, like that's, that's great and cool. But like there's a difference between shipping something now and waiting for this thing to happen in the future. And so this is like the first sort of minor criticism. Um, this one is better. Uh, I don't think ultimately less compelling, but I also think there's a good reasons why people believe this. So async await is weird and it's hard and it's different than synchronous Rust which is also weird and hard, but like in a way that I can manage. Um, and Rust should have used green threads instead of async await. Um, I think that this is coming from a really good place, actually. And it's weirdly a backhanded compliment um, because what these people are saying is, I think Rust is so good that I am like willing to put up with a feature I actively hate because I want to use it anyway. And the problem is, is that those features specifically, and like there's a lot of details there. Um, and again, I gave a talk, I'm also gonna link to a blog post at the end of this that sort of explains a lot of the details. But like using that style of concurrency is incompatible with some of Rust's other goals that it holds to be more important. So you basically like, you really want a garbage collector to implement those kinds of features and do concurrency that way for reasons I don't really have a ton of time to get into because I'm gonna spend time on my criticisms and other people's criticisms because I'm on stage. Um, but the point is just that like, I can appreciate why people want this, but it just doesn't work that way. And so it's unfortunate. So like, I think that this is like, it's really interesting to me that people are like, I like this so much I use the thing I hate anyway. And that's like really cool and nice actually. I also think that if you're interested in making a programming language that people may use someday, there is a space for a language that is not as low level as Rust, but shares a lot of the things that make Rust Rust. And that would be what these people want. Like what they're asking for is a slightly different language. And I do think that language doesn't exist. So I understand their pain and why they argue for it this way, but I just don't think it can actually happen. Um, so there's that. Um, Here's one that gets me unreasonably mad. Uh, async await is bad because now your functions have colors. If you're not familiar with what that means, um, this guy named Bob Nystrom wrote a blog post a while back called What Color Is Your Function? And this is uh, about async await in JavaScript and talks a little bit about Dart, which Bob works on, and Go. Now, I want to make it really clear that I think Bob is, is really great. Like, if I was building a programming languages Avengers, like, Bob would be, like, on the team. I don't know where my life like went wrong that I started saying words like if I was assembling a programming language Avengers, uh, but this is just how I turned out, I guess. I guess what I'm saying is like, just say no to compilers, kids. Like, or someday you too will have like way too many opinions uh, about these kind of things. You know, like I, I, if you're gonna experiment with Lexing, son, I want you to do it at home where we can make sure that you're safe. Uh, you know, like that's, that's a whole thing. I also really briefly, I grew up, I was born in 86, and so my childhood was full of dare and just say no and all that stuff. I love these like things they made as infographics to tell kids like ways to say no to weed. And I was imagining what would it be in ways to say no to compilers? Like get a job, you hippie wasteoid. It's like kind of something you could say about someone that wants you to get into compilers because often they're like, no thanks, I'm a good person. I don't do compiler development. Also like very, very funny. Anyway, back to Bob. <laughs> this blog post is actually good. And I, I think that Bob's points are good. The problem is, is that in a similar fashion, people superficially understand Bob's point and then use it as a thought terminating cliche. I should have put a screenshot of a tweet here from my friend Tef, but he has this amazing post where he's like, programmers are kind of like compilers. They read a blog post and then they come to the first thing they disagree with and they throw an error and they just don't even bother processing the rest of it entirely. And so that's what's happened with this blog post is if, if anyone says async on a forum anywhere, somebody goes, oh, async sucks because it means your, color, your functions have colors. And it's like, that's not actually what this is saying. And also this is like very specific to the implementation in JavaScript, which as we'll get into a little bit later, Rust is very different from. And so it's extra frustrating when it's applied to Rust because it's like, like some of Bob's points are invalid because he wasn't even talking about Rust. He was talking about something else totally different. But like people love to cite this blog post and I feel so bad because again, I respect Bob so much, but like people just throw this out. They don't even think. They just see async await and they go, oh, colored functions, lol. Um, so anyway, 
Uh, and on a more serious level, like what this is really getting down to, the, what Bob means by this colored function thing is that like, he's like, imagine there are red functions and blue functions, and you can only call a blue function from inside another blue function, you can't call a red function from inside a blue function. Like, and that like kind of sucks, because now you have two separate universes, and that's what async is. You have async and non-async, and they can't really mix with each other. Um, but like, when people are like, oh man, if I make a function asynchronous, now it means I have to change the type signature, in a language that's as strongly typed as Rust, is like, yeah, you change the semantics of the function, so you probably need to change the type signature. Like, I actually appreciate that asynchronous is part of the type in Rust. I like the idea of color. Like, like we're not even making an argument. I, I don't even necessarily like believe that having red and blue functions is a bad thing in a language like Rust, where you care about the details and you care about the low-level stuff, and that matters. Like, it is actually significant if a thing is async or not. And so the idea of abstracting over that is like, again totally fully agree in languages that are not trying to do what Rust is trying to do, but like it's just incompatible with Rust's goals. And so that's like a little, a little unfortunate. And so uh, in terms of abstracting things, uh, this is also not necessarily a solvable problem in a systems language currently. There are some people working on it. So this gets half open research problem. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, there's this thing that I've been critical of called the Keyword Generics Initiative in Rust, but there's also the Zig programming language has a really interesting take on this problem. So check those things out if you're interested in seeing what the cutting edge of this particular thing looks like. But again, like we're talking about like one programming language has an implementation of this idea and other ones are maybe talking about a little, and that's like too cutting edge for an industrial language to suggest that you need to rebuild everything to be around that is like, it's a little tough. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop complaining about things that I think are not very great. We're gonna start talking about better complaints of things that I actually like half agree with in terms of why async and await in Rust is a little bad. Um, so if you haven't used async and await in Rust before, um, there's this thing called an executor. And it's the thing that drives the futures to completion. So this would be an event loop in Node. Node has an event loop built in, the v event loop. Um, but in Rust, it's a plug and play, bring your own software thing. And the reason for that is because some people uh, use embedded devices where you may not want any runtime at all. And this is kind of like adding an async runtime to your program. Um, but what's unfortunate about it, though, is that there's no trait for an executor, which is like Rust's version of interfaces. And so the idea of like, oh, well, you can pick and choose your own executor is like technically true, but like in practice is not actually true. And that's because at the lowest level, like imagine you have a future that's based on a timer and it's listening to the OS, it sets up a sleep, and then the, the OS pings it after that period of time and it wakes the future up. That's going to be tied into your particular executor. That's not actually generic. And so if I'm using executor B, but, I'm, but you've written a library that uses executor A, I can't just like swap your library in because there's an incompatibility and there's no good compatibility layers between the two. And so this is a criticism that is, uh, I think, somewhat valid and it is actually painful for people. But the other thing is that uh, nobody got fired for choosing Tokyo. See, like the thing is, is that in practice, there's one executor called Tokyo that in terms of if you're building a web service, like 90% of the time, it's just the right choice. And so the people that tend to feel this pain are people that are trying to build libraries to work with any executor, and that is definitely really annoying. Um, but there's also people who just don't like Tokyo and want to see it go down, and they're trying to argue that it's bad that there's no interoperability because they want all the Tokyo libraries to be used on their favorite executor instead. And so, you know, people continue to argue on the internet. So, like, in reality, this is a problem, but, like, you can avoid this problem by being willing to just, like, you know, buy IBM and then like, it's fine. Like, sure, there are problems, but like, if this is really your biggest problem, then, you know, you just need to write more software or advocate for your favorite executor's ecosystem to grow a little bit bigger, or like put in that kind of work. But the, in terms of building web services, which is what async await is often used for, and we're gonna talk about embedded stuff later, actually, because it is useful for that. Tokyo has like 80% of the ecosystem. So you don't need to worry about swapping stuff out if you just support the big one. Um, and the reason this is a tough problem, like I do think that in, a, in an abstract world, it would be great if there's a way to abstract over executors, but like there's a tension between abstraction and caring about details. And so you could like make an argument that even if you used 
the, like, the, the interface, that would obscure some efficiencies that you built by tying into the specific details of an executor. And if you care about performance, and if you're writing Rust, you probably care about performance, then you like kind of in some ways want to deeply integrate. And so it's kind of counter to your goals. And so even if it did exist, not everybody would use it. So it's just, it's, it's more complicated than just like, there should be a trait and there's not, and that sucks. And so I, I super get this and I feel it, but I'm like not clear that it's an easy problem to solve. And that's like unfortunate. Um, async drop doesn't exist. So Rust has destructors. If a value goes out of scope, there's a function, there's a trait called drop and it will run some code when that thing goes out of, of scope. But with async, it will call synchronous drop destructors, but there's no asynchronous destructor. So like if you're writing something that's asynchronous, your drop has to block which is like weird because you're trying to tear something down. Like this runs when something is being destroyed and so then blocking on that is like not ideal and so it'd be cool if we had async drop. Yeah, totally. Like this is, I get it. Like this is, I think this is a reasonable good criticism. There has been some work on this area and we're gonna talk about how this interacts with some other things a little bit later. So I don't even necessarily think this is like a bad argument exactly. This is kind of like the difference basically which is the drop trait has a function called drop and then the async drop trait in theory, this is a proposal, would be the exact same thing with async on the front. And this gets back to that whole like abstracting over async versus sync. It's like, okay, they're two different traits. Wouldn't it be cool if we could just like make it maybe async instead? But I think there's like problems there too. And so this like feels, this feels very simple, but it's actually more complicated than that. And so that's like kind of weird and frustrating. Um, Another one that I think is like a, a pretty good argument but it gets really hairy is that async chose a readiness model when it should have chosen a completeness model. These are two different ways of designing asynchronous systems. If you haven't heard of these before, the simplest way I like to explain it is that readiness is basically say, hey, please let me know when you're ready to do that work and I'm gonna wait until then. This is how ePoll works basically. And completion is, hey, please let me know when you're done with this work I'm going to give you, which is like IOU ring and IOCP. So imagine you're copying some bytes off a network and the readiness model you say, hey, when the bytes are ready on the NIC, let me know, and then it says, hey, we're ready, and then you say, cool, and you copy them into a buffer. In completion, you say, hey, here's a buffer. Please copy information into it. Let me know when it's all copied, and then give me the buffer back. So these are two strategies. Historically, Unix has chosen readiness, and Windows has chosen completion, but now we have IOU ring, so you get both options on Linux, um, and I actually don't know a ton about readiness on Windows, even though I'm a Windows user. Uh, so anyway, there's a bunch of really deep problems here I don't really want to get into. Part of the reason why Rust chose readiness is because of the time these decisions were being made. IOU ring was like a twinkle in some developer's eye and it didn't really super exist. And there's ways of pasting over, like these models are compatible with each other. And also there's like some problems with Rust static analysis where the like completion model is awkward. And so there's like actually a lot of details here and people are working on this. And uh, it's cool. It's also unfortunate that it's like not necessarily done or easy yet. Like the, it's like a semi-open question. And this is incidentally a really great reason to not choose Tokyo because Tokyo was built around this, this readiness idea. And so there's people who've written executors that are like better at the completion model and are specific to IOU ring. And I think that's a fantastic reason to use those instead. Um, okay. Now we're gonna talk about the best criticism, AKA my criticism. Um, but not just this, also, so like I got, I got my oxide shirt up here and my slides are all branded. Like part of this talk came out of discussing with coworkers, like we were like, we had to make the decision, do we use async Rust or not? Because like the company's named Oxide, all of our stuff is written in Rust. We deeply care about Rust. And so we had to decide we're building a control plane and that involves a lot of asynchronicity. So we're like, should we use async Rust or not? Um, because it is like still under development and there's some rough edges and we decided to go into it. And so we recently kind of had a retrospective of like, okay, people are complaining about async Rust at all. Like, do we have pain points with async Rust? And if so, what are those? And we all kind of, I mean, we all, again, I'm gonna abstract a little bit, but in talking with many of my coworkers, they were like, yeah, the criticisms I see from people online don't really resonate with me. My criticisms are things I don't see anyone ever talking about. So this is kind of the like hard one. We wrote hundreds of thousands of lines of async Rust and like this is like the biggest beef that we run into. And this is this problem called cancellation. So if you have an asynchronous process and you wanna stop it in the middle for whatever reason, you're canceling that particular amount of work. I almost called this talk canceling async rust, but then I was like, that's too close to a politics joke and I wanna stay away from it. But I just, the, the pun person in me just like really, really wanted to make it. Um, so here's an example of a function uh, that's synchronous. And what it does is there's some sort of state 
and it, it is wrapped in a mutex. So on this first line, we're locking the mutex, and then we're going to take the current state out that's guarded by the mutex, and we would do something with it, and then we, we call advance to like move the state forward, and then we put it back into the system state. And then at the end, the mutex will relock, and so this is great. This is totally normal code. Um, this works if you run this a zillion times. This expect invariant violated state was run. You won't see it happen unless something is like really seriously wrong. But like the, the semantically, this code is correct, and you won't ever see that. And one of the promises of async Rust is you can take your synchronous Rust and just smack on some asyncs and awaits, and it probably will just work by using slightly different APIs. So here is the exact same function, but using the Tokyo mutex instead of the regular mutex. Again, I talked to Tokyo earlier, but I'm going to like push back on some Tokyo stuff here. Balance, I guess, I don't know. Point is, it's almost the exact same code, right? Like it's just like, oh, there's an await, there's an await, and that's like it. This code is horribly broken, actually. You will, if you like kill tasks as they're running, you will get invariant violated state is none. And you'd be like, well, how the heck does that even happen? I'm like wrapping it in a mutex all the time. Well, here's the thing. Rust async await doesn't like run stuff in the background and then pause when the await stuff stops. You're building up a state machine that you then pass to the executor and then it iterates through each step. And so every await point is a point where the universe can pause. And so if this task hits this await point, we have unlocked the mutex and we've taken the state out. But if somebody kills that before this line runs, then the destructor of the mutex will go, oh, this function's over, I'd better relock myself. But now it's locked itself over a none, and there's nothing there. And when the next task comes along, it's going to find that this state was lost. So we've now introduced a place where we can lose some state purely because we've introduced async await. And so, you know, this may be a little bit in the weeds, but like, it's, it's really important. And it comes directly out of Rust semantics around async await and how they're very different than JavaScript. So for example, here's a function, main, that calls a function called print hello that's async, and it says print l and hi. And if you run this in Rust, unlike in languages like JavaScript, this won't print anything because you didn't actually invoke the print hello function when you invoked it. It returned a future, and then you never did anything with the future, so nothing happens. You have to actively like tell the future to go. And so this is also how cancellation happens because when something doesn't go if you don't tell it to, the way you cancel it is you just stop telling it to go. Oh, that computation is paused at this part. I'm just never going to tell it to go again. Now it's canceled. This is like a very simple and straightforward model. And honestly, when a single way it was being designed, we we're like, heck yeah, it's awesome. It's very straightforward. But the problem is, is that even though it's easy and straightforward, it doesn't mean it does what you actually want. Uh, or that there aren't surprising foot guns here. And I don't mean to say that cancellation is bad. It's actually like really important in general, and it's really good that it's easy, but it's like weird that your instincts from sync rust will maybe lead you astray in async rust and lead to these problems. Um, I was helping a coworker debug an issue that involved pulling operating system state, and he was like, I don't see how this is a problem. And I was like, well, you know, the, the mutex unlocks itself here. And he's like, but it's covered by the mutex. I was like, no, 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 if it pauses that await, then it's not going to finish running your code. And he's like, oh, no. And like, that's, it's, it's very tricky. And like, it's, yeah. So we talk about this idea called cancel correctness, which basically means like, if there's a cancel on, say, future somewhere, and it's canceled, and it violates property of the system, that's bad. So like, there is like a way you need, once you use async await in Rust, you need to start thinking about this problem. And like, as a tiny, tiny aside, there are some people that are like, why do I need to tack dot await onto things? If the compiler knows it needs to be awaited, why doesn't it just do that magically? Well, the only reason we were able to debug this problem is because I know I can look for dot await in the function signatures and see where can this be paused and stopped. And so this is like an example of how verbosity is not always necessarily a problem. I think the fact that await points are explicit here means it's really easy for me, really easy for me, uh, after the thing has happened. It is possible for me to look at this code and reason about it and know where the pauses are and go, oh yeah, I bet that's where it's a problem without needing to run or debug it dynamically. And I can only spot that point because the awaits are explicit. And so I think this is a really important thing. And so sometimes people have talked about removing await, but I don't support that for those reasons. Um, here's another thing that stinks about this situation. There's an async book in Rust that's supposed to teach you everything you need to know about programming Rust in async. Here's the chapter in the book on cancellation, to do. It's been like this since 2015. 
The official documentation does not explain to you how to use this feature in a safe and appropriate way. And that is really unfortunate and kind of a failing of all this. And it's also why people get a little worked up about it because they're pretty, like, when people found out about this problem, like, they, uh, that, I, that I know, they were like, man, I'm like having a weird emotional reaction to this. But that's because in Rust, everything is so strict. And then once you get it through the strictness, it works so often that like, when it doesn't, you feel lied to. You're like, Rust, you've had my back through like the hardest threading problems that existed. And then when it comes to this cancellation thing, you're just like, yep, looks good to me. And like, that just like, it's unfortunate from a user perspective thing. And so like, this is like a thing that you only run into, because like, again, it, this relies on a future being paused at the specific moment and the task being canceled at exactly that moment. So this isn't the kind of bug where something bad happens every time. This is kind of the bug where you're like, yeah, we ran 15,000 iterations in the test and two iterations it blew up. Now I gotta figure out what's going on. And that's like not a great feeling, especially when you're already investing in a language that cares about static analysis and good error messages and you're like coddled in this warmth of Rust C and it's like, yeah, whatever, I just dropped that state, I don't care. And so like it's just, it's a little frustrating. Um, and like it's worth remembering though, I was like other languages don't help you with this at all either really. And it's like true, but it's like I'm not using other languages because I like, like this property of Rust. And so it, it's weird because like I hold Rust to a higher standard here than other languages just solely because Rust is usually so good at statically analyzing problems. Um, Tokyo's documentation actually has these paragraphs that like I would summarize as like, please don't use the Tokyo Mutex actually. And they give a couple little recommendations, but like this doesn't explain cancellation and when you have a to-do and then these couple paragraphs, like this is like basically all the official docs that exist on this problem. And so you just like, you don't run into it until you run into it and then you're like, why isn't anyone talking about this? And it's like, because they're busy arguing about syntax. Like you have to, you run into this problem when you build real production systems. And so it just means it gets discussed a lot less and I think that's really unfortunate because there are possible ways of solving it. Uh, one example would be helpful would be async drop. Um, the reason this works the way that it does is because the drop trade on the mutex like runs when it does, but like async drop like could help here a little bit. And this is an example of a place where it would. I don't have time to get super get into all the details. Um, another example where cancellation happens, this code is cancel safe, but when you select between two different futures. So when the receiver receives the value or the sleep future, these are racing and you select between which one of them. And once you pick one side or the other, the other futures get dropped. So if those aren't cancel safe, this is gonna introduce a problem. Select is an awesome feature. It's really cool that we can write code like this, but it stinks that we then have to like manually think about this problem when building these things. And so this keeps coming up actually. So I say nobody's talking about this, but people have of course always talked about it. When I was preparing for this talk, I looked through old blog posts that were criticizing async await to like relive all of the arguments that I talked about earlier. And like people have been talking about this ever since async rust existed. And every once in a while, like one out of every 10 blog posts that's like async rust has a problem. Like one of them says there's this cancellation thing that nobody knows about. And the nine of them are like, I don't really like that it does something else that's superficial. And so it gets really easy to like stop paying attention to these superficial criticisms, and then you end up running these big problems. So what I would like to see is that like, people talk about this problem more, and that's kind of like what I'm getting at for here. Um, additionally, I'd like to see this be fixed maybe in software. So my coworker Rain has been working on this library called Cancel Safe Futures. It's also based off of some mutex stuff that my other coworker Cliff had been working on for embedded async Rust. And basically we have this Cancel Safe robust mutex. You may be joking, of course it's robust, implying other ones aren't robust. This is actually because there's a Unix API called a robust mutex, so they're the ones that are being like full of themselves with the naming, we just inherited it. Um, but what this does is this gives you a thing where you can lock the mutex and then you get a closure that you do operations on the mutex in. And notably, this closure is not async. And since it's not async, you can't put a wait in it, which means it can't be paused during this kind of critical section. And therefore, this no longer has that cancellation problem. This API, as opposed to that other API, ends up solving this problem. Um, and I would also like to point out that in the red blue functions discussion, this is a blue function living inside of a red function, which is why it's different in Rust than in JavaScript, which is why that whole thing annoys me. Anyway, um, I'm almost done here, but this library would be kind of cool. I asked Rain about sharing it with you all since literally the reason this is green is because this mutex is still in a pull request on this. She was like, yes, please share this with everyone. So if you're interested in this problem in Rust, you can check it out. Also, if you're interested in a, like, to sort of go with the good, just to be clear, async Rust is basically a miracle. Like, 
back when I was joking about open research problems, like basically you have like Rust and C++ are the only languages that have this stuff in a non-garbage collected language. Like it's honestly amazing that it exists at all. The fact that you can use it without allocations and therefore you can use asynchronous stuff in, in embedded Rust. Like there are embedded things that you use async await in, which is like kind of wild because you think of it as a JavaScript feature, but you're using it in this like low level context. Turns out hardware is actually pretty async. So depending on what you're doing, it actually may be good for you. But um, yesterday, uh, Boats, who I showed in the RFC earlier, wrote this really great blog post called Why Async Rust. And this goes over in detail the history of Async Rust, how it came to be, some of the trade-offs that were made. So if you're interested in learning more about semantics, so therefore you can make better criticisms and help us make Async Rust better, um, I would highly recommend reading this blog post. It's kind of straight from the source. And yeah, um, Eliza, my personal opinion is it's very close to the best possible design for a language with Rust goals and design constraints in response to this post. It's been really incredible to use it in an operating systems kernel and in other embedded projects. And so, you know, a lot of this talk has been about criticism, but I want to make it clear that I think async Rust is a thing that sort of had to exist and is one of the only reasons why Rust is as popular as it is, but that also doesn't mean that it's perfect. And I spent a lot of time talking about the good, so I'm going to focus a little bit more on the bad, but like ultimately, uh, you know, it is what it is. So to wrap up, finally, some goals here. Uh, I want to raise the awareness of this problem of cancellation. If you're writing async Rust today and you haven't thought about cancellation before, please go check out your code. Um, you may have bugs you don't realize, or if there's been a bug that's like strange, you don't know what the problem is, this might be the problem. So put it in the back of your head as like something that may happen. Um, I would love to see more thoughtful criticism and less superficial criticism. I don't expect Hacker News to get better because I gave a conference talk, unfortunately. Um, and I would also like Oxide to try and help and address this problem in a meaningful way. And that's what we're going to do with this library, but also um, we have this internal like RFD system where we talk about things and we post long written documents about problems. And we have two separate ones on our struggles with async await. And the intention is to publish that publicly so we can try to help contribute to make these problems better. And uh, on a personal level, maybe I'll stop arguing on forums. Uh, I deleted my Twitter like two weeks ago, and that's like a huge thing. So if I can do that, maybe someday I'll be able to quit forum arguing too. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk.